Tonight my topic is the fatal attraction of the cults. Down through the centuries, Satan has used his wily deceptions on mankind. If he cannot get us to worship the created things rather than the creator, he will attempt to exalt man above God. The devil, down through the centuries, has attempted to switch the object of worship from who the creator is to who man is. Down through the centuries, Satan has attempted to deceive human beings by exalting man above God. And that is the key element of the cults. I want to take you back, back to Rome, to the days of the imperial cult, and see what lessons we can learn about today. The imperial cult in ancient Rome was the worship of a few select emperors as gods once they were deceased. In other words, often as an emperor like Trajan died, he would be deified or exalted to the place of God. But there was one emperor who declared that he was God not after he died, but while he was living. The only emperor to declare himself a god while still living was Domitian. Domitian accomplished a great deal in ancient Rome. He was one of the great builders of Rome and repaired Rome after a period of decline and collapse. Domitian was an emperor from the, in the latter part of the first century. It was Domitian that exiled John, the last of the living apostles, to the island of Patmos. It was Domitian that demanded and commanded worship as God. Suetonius was a historian of Rome. He describes the ego of Domitian this way. He, Domitian, restored a great many important buildings that are now gutted ruins, including the capital, but allowed no names to be inscribed on them except his own, not even the original builders. I mean, you have to have a lot of pride to do that, don't you? A lot of egotism to do that. When the building projects were taking place in Rome, Suetonius says that Domitian wouldn't allow anybody's name on any building except his own, even the builders. But then this historian of Rome goes on, Suetonius, and he says, just as arrogantly he, Domitian, began a letter which his agents were to circulate with the words, our Lord and God instructs you to do this. So Domitian began his letter with the words, our Lord and God instructs you to do this, and Lord God became his regular title, both in writing and conversation. So the title of Domitian was Lord God. He saw himself as the embodiment of God. He was to be worshiped, so temples were built in his honor. The imperial cult in Rome was based on the idea that Domitian was more than a man, more than a leader, but God himself. This is revealed on the coins of Domitian. Here is a coin with Domitian's head on one side, his son, who he believed was deified or became godlike because he came from Domitian, is on the other side, and the reverse side of the coin shows the deified son of Domitian. Many temples were erected throughout the Roman Empire to Domitian, and the Apostle Paul had to meet the worship of Domitian as God. This is Ephesus. This past summer, among the other places we traveled for research for this series was Ephesus. Ephesus is located in the country of Turkey today. And you remember in the Bible, there was a letter written to the Ephesians, Christians, by the Apostle Paul. Ephesus was a city of about 150,000 people. It was a city of culture and a city of art. It was a city of many temples to various pagan gods. This was the main thoroughfare in Ephesus. Walking down this thoroughfare, you go to the very famous Celsius Library. Just off this street to the left, right at this bend, there was a temple. The temple that was erected was erected to Domitian. 
This is the temple or the ruins of the temple of Domitian. In front of this temple, there was a statue of Domitian that was 15 feet tall. The apostle Paul preached in Ephesus. And as Paul preached in here, he preached against the imperial cult of Domitian and the idea that any human being could be a representative or be the incarnation of God. Here are the ruins of the temple of Domitian, built on the platform of the god Domitian, who claimed indeed that these were his qualities. The apostle Paul preached in Ephesus. He led many to Christ, and when he read, wrote his letter to the Ephesians, this is what Paul said, Ephesians 1, verse 2 and 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Paul said, our Lord is in heaven. We look not to Domitian. We look not to an earthly temple. We look to the temple in heaven. We do not look to a human being pretending to be God. We look to Jesus Christ who is in heaven and he there will bless us with all spiritual blessings. Then Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 3 verse 20, now to him, that is to Jesus Christ, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. Jesus can't only do more than you can think, he can do above what you can think. He can not only do above what you can think, he can do abundantly above what you can think. He can not only do abundantly above what you can think, he can do what everybody? Exceedingly, abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Paul was saying, in that city of Ephesus, that city where the temple of Domitian was dominant, that city that when you walk down the street, you see the large image to Domitian. The apostle Paul was saying, look not to an earthly leader, look to Jesus Christ. Through his living power, he can work a miracle in your life. You may have come to this meeting tonight looking for a miracle. Christ can work a miracle in your life. He can work a miracle in that broken family. He can work a miracle in your finances. He can work a miracle in your health. He can change depression to encouragement, sorrow to joy. He can change tears to laughter. He is the Christ that can do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or think, wherever you're watching tonight. Jesus Christ is reaching out to you. He can do exceedingly, abundantly above what you could ask or think. He is still the miracle working Christ. Are cults a thing of the past? Are all the cults back there in Rome? Or are there cults today? And could it be that many Christians unknowingly are preparing to fall for the greatest cult of all when the Antichrist comes as predicted in Revelation? Tonight I want to show you first that cults are exploding around the world among our young people. Second, I want to show you that Satan has a strategy for Christians to deceive them by the Antichrist and unwittingly many Christians are having their minds set to accept the master cult by the Antichrist. What did Jesus predict about these days of earth's histories? You know, there are many false gods but only one true God. There are many false Christs but only one true Christ. And when Jesus was talking about end times in Matthew chapter 24, when he's talking about wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes, Jesus says this, Matthew 24, verse 24, read it with me please. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. So they must be true prophets because they're showing signs and wonders and working miracles, right? What does he say? He says they are what kind of prophets? False. False Christ, false prophets, what do they show? Signs and what? Wonders. So merely because somebody supposedly works a spectacular miracle doesn't mean that they are a true genuine prophet or a true Christ. The Bible says that in the end time, false Christs and false prophets will arise. To deceive, to do what? 
deceive, if possible, even the elect. Who are the elect? The elect are the chosen of God. So the devil has a mastermind strategy. If it were not subtle, it would, and if it were obvious, we may not fall for it quickly. So the devil has a subtle strategy in which he's going to try to deceive thousands of people to follow the false Christ at end time and the false cult. Now, the Bible teaches that false Christ and false prophets would arise. That indeed is happening before our eyes. They are rising claiming to be God-like or ha being having God within them or the authority of God. Jim Jones, for example, back in the late 1970s led over 900 people to the jungles of Guyana in the cult of death where they took a Kool-Aid lace cyanide poison at his command. When he was speaking, and I've listened to tapes of his sermons in my research, he said, there's a lot of God in me. He said, when you look at me, don't look at me because you're seeing God. His followers accepted his authority. He was a mainline Protestant minister in San Francisco, and they accepted his authority as he said, I have the God within me that is speaking to you. Or you take David Koresh, Waco, Texas a few years ago, Recently, in my lecture tour in Australia, I interviewed a young man who had been in the compound with David Koresh two weeks before it burned. He was an ardent follower of Koresh. Koresh said, I am the Lamb of Revelation. Again, like Domitian in the past, like Jim Jones, cult leaders claiming to have the authority of God. Take Marshall Applewhite, Rancho Santa Fe, California, living in a $3.5 million mansion with his followers. There was a postal worker there, housewife there, teacher there. He said, I am on an evolutionary level higher than mankind. He said, I have the qualities of God. Same principle all the way through. You look at the cult leaders. Take Shoko Asherada, Japan, the cult of doom as they believed the end times were coming. And he was like a messianic figure, like a messiah. Same principle. The principle is simply this. Anytime you allow somebody else to become your messianic figure for you, your mind is getting ready to accept delusion in the cult. The Order of the Solar Temple, France, Joseph D. Mambo and Luc Jarrett, again, messianic figures that speak for their followers, that coerce allegiance, that amass large followings. Joseph Kebetrer and Credonia Mwende in the country of Uganda rose up claiming to be messianic figures. A recent cult group has arisen in the former Soviet Union with Pietra Kuznestov, and uh, he says, I represent the true Russian Orthodox Church, I'm a messianic figure, and they were hiding, waiting for doomsday, and so forth. When you see the principle, it's very simple. The principle is a leader arises who claims to have the messianic godlike qualities. We can expect this to happen more and more and more today. An estimated five to seven million Americans in the United States and Canada have been involved in cults or cult-like groups. Approximately one in every 60 Americans has been involved in a cult. Some of those cults, though, are much, much more subtle. Let me give you an example. There are approximately 180,000 new cult converts in the United States alone every single year. One of those cult-like movements that's growing, there are between 3,000, 5,000 new religious movements that have sprung up in the last 25 years. Three to 5,000. But they all have the same principle. Either a cult-like Messiah or the idea of developing the God within you. Anything to take the attention off Jesus Christ. Anything to take the attention off Jesus as the Savior. Now, one of those cults that are growing is New Age movement. 
A study of a recent two-year period revealed 73% increase in New Age books. Somebody says, the New Age movement, a cult? Why do you label that as a cult? Simple. The New Age movement says this, every one of us has God within us. Oh, it's not the worship of Domitian not the worship of, of, of a cult leader like Jim Jones, a much more sophisticated deception. There is God within you. No need to repent on your knees. No need to cry out to God because of a fallen sinful nature. No need to confess and accept Jesus and the cross of Calvary. But oh, peace and joy, pendants, meditation, just develop the God within you. The devil has a deception today because he's preparing for the mighty deception at the end with the great Antichrist. Anything that shifts our attention from Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary is cult-like. Forbes magazine reported $2 billion a year in the United States spent on AIDS for spiritual and physical well-being. Thousands of people in a modern, sophisticated age have the idea, I will be, I'll better myself and develop the God within me. True, genuine, authentic Christianity leads us out of ourself to the living Jesus Christ who can transform our lives. We look not at the weakness of our own nature, we look not at the sinfulness of our own flesh. We look not at the fallenness of who we are. We look from our weakness to his strength. We look from our frailty to his enduring might. We look from who we are to who he is. We look not inside of us, but we look to Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. The reason cults are growing today is because people are seeking. You see, the materialism of the 21st century has let men and women down. The secularism of the 21st century has left our hearts barren. We've spent our time buying things, and the things have left ourselves empty. We've spent ourselves amassing our credit cards, and all they do is run up debt with higher percentages. We've spent our time trying to climb the corporate ladder, but there's something missing inside of us. And if that something is not filled with Jesus, if it's not filled with the Bible, then we, because we are spiritual beings by nature, go searching out something else, and that other thing often becomes a deceptive cult. Cult followers are looking for answers. May I suggest to you tonight, may I make a very bold statement tonight, one of the reasons cults are growing is because of the failure of the Christian church in the West to call for radical discipleship. You see, cults are gonna grow. Cults will grow. When a church discards or downplays the Bible, young people are gonna go looking for authority someplace else. If young people come to church and the sermon's a pablum, if young people come to church and there's no power of the living God in that congregation, Young people are going to go looking for spirituality someplace else and be deceived by cults. Why is it that thousands of America seek the New Age movement? It is because the church at times has become so spiritually weak. And when the church is spiritually weak because human beings have the longing for spirituality, they'll go someplace else. There is a search for authority in our world today. We don't want if, maybe, perhaps, I think it might be this way. You decide, do whatever you want. Human beings fundamentally are looking for direction. Fundamentally, they're looking for positive answers. Fundamentally, they're looking for somebody says, this is what God says. They're not looking for somebody who says, look, this might be right, this might be wrong, this may be moral, this may be immoral, you choose for yourself. That's moral confusion, moral chaos. And when the church does not have an authoritative voice, when it downplays or discards the Bible, people check out. They go looking for something else. When the church lacks spiritual power, when it's just a sham, when it's a pretense, when it's hypocrisy, when drug addicts aren't being delivered because there's no power, when alcoholics are not being delivered because there's no power, when marriages are not being put together because there's no power, people say, look, I'll go follow some cult leader because maybe there is power. You see, when the church discards or downplays the Bible, when it lacks spiritual power, when the church reveals to 
reveal God's love. When young people come into the church and they're looking for love, they may be, they may be uh, dressed differently, they may look differently, they may act differently, but they don't want somebody over there criticizing them and condemning them. And when the church becomes so filled with critics and it doesn't reveal God's love, then they look for some place where the cult provides that form of love. So what does the cult do? The church may not provide the Bible, and the, and the cult provides authority. The, the cult often will have some kind of power going on, and these kids see lives being changed. Uh, certainly changed by the evil one, certainly changed in deception, but they see something happening. And these kids, what do they see? I've talked to thousands of young people. They say, look, if the church doesn't love me for who I am, I'm gonna check out, you see. And so when the church discards or downplays the Bible, lacks spiritual power, fails to reveal God's love, people go someplace else. Don't you long for a church that's upholding the Bible and the Bible only? Don't you long for a church that's really teaching God's word authoritatively? Don't you long for a church where there's spiritual power and you come week by week every Sabbath and hearts are being touched and lives are being changed and people are being transformed? Don't you long for a church that reveals God's love? We just sense that love when you walk through those doors that God is moving powerfully. The Bible says in the last days, Satan's going to be a deceiver. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, no wonder. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You see, Satan is very wise. And he is going to transform himself in the great antichrist power at the end time. And the antichrist power at the end time is going to present authority. It's going to present power. And it's going to present some form that looks like love. And many people, they're not grounded in Jesus Christ, they're not grounded, grounded in the Word of God, and then they're not grounded in faith, but they have some kind of superficial Christianity. They're going to check out, and they're going to go after the Antichrist. What are the ways we can identify a cult? And what principles will Satan use in the last days? The Bible clearly distinguishes between the genuine and the counterfeit. You need not be misled. You need not be misled. When men and women give their lives to Christ, Jesus keeps us through the great crisis that is coming ahead. The Bible helps us distinguish between truth and error. The Bible is clear. It cuts right to the point. It cuts through truth and error. Now, there are five identifying characteristics of a cult. I want to walk you through them, and I want to show you that the Antichrist at the end will have every one of these characteristics, and I want to show you how the devil is preparing the mind of people today to receive the Antichrist. First, cults have a single powerful leader who becomes the cult's messiah. That is characteristic every time. What does that mean for you and me? It means that if anybody in our life today becomes our messiah, if anyone in our life today becomes our source, our sole source of religious information, and we do not know Jesus Christ for ourselves, we're setting up our minds for a counterfeit. No, I thank God for pastors and for rabbis and for priests and for bishops if they're faithfully teaching God's word. I thank God for every religious teacher. But I will say this to you. If you know what God's truth is in the Bible and you go to your pastor or your priest or your religious teacher and they say to you, oh, but, but you know, um, do this or do that. If you surrender your mind to the information coming from a religious leader and they become your sole source of authority when the Holy Spirit convicts you to do something else and you know it's true in the Bible, you are setting up your mind to be deceived by the Antichrist at the end because the Antichrist principle is the substitution of something else and someone else for Jesus and his word. One of the devil's greatest deceptions is getting us to look at human beings rather than Jesus. That's one of the greatest deceptions that the devil has, trying to get us to shift our confidence of authority and to have other human beings in our life as the greatest authority figure. But somebody says, I'm very sincere, that's all that counts. Well, Proverbs 16, verse 25 says, there is a way that seems right to the man, but its end is the way of what? Death. He thinks it's right. If I go out here and get on the highway going home tonight, and I get in the wrong lane and I'm coming into head-on traffic, I may be very, very sincere, but my sincerity is not going to keep me from getting hit head-on, right? You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely what? Wrong. Sure. I may be very sincere, look in the opposite direction. I may fall down these things and break my leg, and I say, oh, I was sincere. Or suppose you're driving down the road and you drive through a red light, 
and one of those little cars follows you with those little red lights on the top and you just went through a traffic light that was red and the, and the and, you know, they have them here in Florida, they have them throughout the United States. You know those kind of black and white cars with those little red things on the top? And you go through the red light and the, and the policeman pulls you aside and he comes over and says, I'm gonna write you a ticket. And you say, please don't, I was very sincere. <laughs> What's he gonna say to you? Whether you're sincere or not, buddy, you just went through the red light, right? The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is what? Death. You can be sincere, but you can be going the wrong direction. Sincerity is not enough because you can sincerely follow error and be lost. So God doesn't ask us, hey, be sincere. He says, commit your life to me. Dedicate your mind to me in the word of God, and I will reveal to you truth. Cults shift the attention from Jesus to human beings. Anytime we transfer our loyalty to a religious leader and exalt that religious leader in the place of God, we are on very, very dangerous ground. I have people come to our meetings all the time. They go out of the meeting and say, Pastor Mark, you know, we studied about the law of God. We studied about the Sabbath. It was so clear. But I went to my pastor, and my pastor said this. And I say to them, you know, there's a poem that I love. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? The teachings of men so often mislead me. But this my only question be, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? Would you agree with me tonight that it's very, very dangerous when the Holy Spirit convicts you with something in his word that you fail to do that because of what some other human being, be it a religious teacher or not, says? Would you agree with me tonight that when the Spirit convicts you of something in God's Word and you see it plainly in God's Word, the only safety is to do what Jesus says? Would you agree with me that tonight? Anytime we transfer our loyalty to another religious leader, we are on very dangerous ground. That's what happened in Waco. When I was interviewing this young man, I interviewed him for well over an hour, and I said to him, tell me, what was it that led you to Waco? Why did you leave Australia? Why did you go to that compound in Texas? He said, rather than study the Bible for myself, I would simply listen to what David Koresh said and what he said I accepted because he was my Messiah-like figure. That is dangerous. There's only one Messiah. And that's Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, let no one deceive you by any means. No one do what? Deceive you. For that day, this is the second coming of Christ, will not come unless there is a falling away first. Now notice, before the coming of Jesus, there'll be a falling away. People often ask, will the Antichrist appear before Jesus comes or after Jesus comes? Well, the Bible's clear. Let no one deceive you. Don't be deceived. That day, the second coming of Christ is not going to occur until there's a falling away first. Then the Bible says, and the man of sin, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition means lawlessness. So this is the Antichrist's power. He comes first before Jesus comes, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. What did Satan do in heaven? Satan exalted himself to be above the throne of God. What does the Antichrist do? He exalts himself so that men and women on earth put their attention on the authority of the Antichrist rather than on the authority of, of Jesus Christ. So that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So the Antichrist tries to take the place of God. And that's a biblical principle. Let no one take the place of God for you. Why will millions fall for the Antichrist in the future? Because they're not making spiritual decisions for themselves right now. They're depending on somebody else to make their spiritual decisions for them. If you are a husband or a wife or a child, only thing that we can do is make spiritual decisions for ourselves. But if we let others make our spiritual decisions for us, then we develop an Antichrist complex in our mind. What do I mean by that? 
We set our mind to receive the Antichrist at the end because we've never learned to make spiritual decisions for ourselves. The only way we can be saved is commit our lives personally to Jesus and make a decision in our life that we are going to follow him through his grace and by his power. The Bible says, 1 John 2 verse 18, little children, it is the what hour? Last hour. And if you, as you have heard, the Antichrist is what? Coming. So if it says the Antichrist is coming, that means the Antichrist is in the what? Future. But notice then what it says. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. So the Antichrist is coming, future. But now, many Antichrists have come. In other words, there are many who try to substitute for Jesus, whether they are the David Koresh-like figures, whether they are the Jim Jones-like figures, the Marshall Applewhite figures, or they can be other figures in your life who have that principle. In other words, God calls us to worship only him. Now, anti doesn't mean in any way against in this passage. It means another. So an antichrist is a substitute or a counterfeit Christ. Jesus appeals to us to worship him supremely. There are no substitutes for Jesus. There are only counterfeits. There's only one that was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. That's Jesus. That's why the Bible says in Acts 4 verse 12, nor is there salvation where in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no one else we can come to Jesus. He forgives our sins. Maybe you've never made that commitment before. You can come to Jesus Christ and find forgiveness of sin. Not only does he forgive you, but he comes into your life. He changes you. He makes you over again. Neither is there salvation from any other. He can break the chains that hold you. He can break the bonds that hold you. Christianity is real, my friend, and Jesus Christ can do something for you that is far beyond what you think. You see, there was only one that was born in Bethlehem's manger of a virgin, conceived in the womb of Mary, and that was Jesus Christ. There's only one Savior that touched the eyes of the blind and they were open, that healed the ears of the deaf, that gripped those withered arms and they had new life, that raised sick men and women filled with the malady of disease off their beds of illness, and that's Jesus. There is only one Jesus. He raised the dead. There is only one Jesus. He labored up Calvary's hill with the wooden cross upon his shoulder, the crown of thorns upon his head. There is only one Jesus, and he hung on Calvary's cross with nails through his hands. There is only one Jesus, and he is resurrected from the dead, and he lives in heaven for you and me. And the Bible says, Isaiah, the 45th chapter, the 22nd verse, look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. The devil wants to get our eyes off Jesus. Do not allow him to do it in your life. First issue of cults. All cults have some substitute for Jesus Christ. Let nothing substitute for Jesus in your life. Let no one substitute for Jesus in your life. God uses people, but they do not become substitutes for Christ. When the Holy Spirit convicts you to do something, and you know it's truth, step out in Jesus' name and do it. Now, the second way to identify a cult is this. Cults substitute human teachings for God's word. It's very subtle. Cults gradually depart from the Bible. They mix truth and error. That's why the Bible says that people will accept many counterfeits. Why do people accept counterfeits? Because they don't know how to distinguish truth and error because they do not know the word of God. And so this pastor says one thing, the next pastor says another thing, the priest says something else, and they're all confused because there's so many contradictory things being said. They haven't taken God's word and studied it for themselves. Therefore, they are misled. Cults usually are led by powerful, charismatic leaders 
who distort God's word, don't give a complete picture of God's word, but deceive people who don't know God's word. They don't know how to distinguish between truth and error. The Bible says, John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your what? Truth, your word is truth. That's why during this lecture series in Orlando, and wherever you are watching, we offer you Bible study guides. We say, go home, study God's word. Do not take Mark Finley's word for what I say. Don't take my word, take God's word. My goal is to lead you to know the word of God more deeply. Because as our faith is anchored in God's word, it cannot be shaken. That's why the Bible says, his word is truth. I've had people say, but my pastor said, my, my, my priest said, and my question to them is, what did God's word say? The Bible teaches that it's the supreme source of authority. Marshall Applewhite, for example, leader of the cult out in Rancho Santa Fe, California, had a great following. Scores of people followed him. And he said, yes, the world is going to come to an end. It sounded good. He said, yes, the prophecies of the Bible are going to come fulfilled. That sounded good. Then he said, right after the hale bop comet, there will be a saucer that descends that we can all get on. But the Bible was very plain when it said, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, read it with me, please. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? Shout. With the voice of what? The archangel. With the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. My Bible does not tell me Jesus Christ is coming in any saucer. It tells me that when Jesus Christ comes, the earth will shake. The heavens will be illuminated with the glory of God. The graves will be opened. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And we that are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Those followers of Marshall Applewhite should have known. But because they lack knowledge of the Bible, they did not. All cults will pervert the word of God. You know, I was in Moscow's Olympic Stadium. And I was preaching there. We had preached in Pohana University. We had preached in Moscow. We had preached in the uh, Kremlin Auditorium. And I was preaching in the Olympic Stadium. 18,000 people coming out to the Olympic Stadium. We had baptized hundreds and hundreds of people there in Moscow, actually thousands, many of them former Russian army officers, former KGB and security people. Well, I got up to preach. It was opening night in the Olympic Stadium. Probably 8,000 people in that session, 8,000, 10,000 in the early afternoon session. So 16 to 18,000 coming. I got up to speak, and as I got up, as was the tradition in Russia at the time, many of the ladies got up out of the audience, and many had come to Christ, and they'd come out of communism. They were so excited. So they would bring us bouquets of flowers, and they would come up, and I would bend over, pick up the flowers, hand them to my wife or somebody standing next to me. And so they were coming up and down the aisle, and there were probably 10 or 12 ladies coming and giving us flowers. And um, a lady came down the aisle. I should have known the flowers were wilted. When I went to take them, this lady, not dressed exactly like you see her here, this lady, who was in normal Russian dress because she didn't want anybody to recognize her, Mary David Christ. She said she was Mary, the mother of God. She believed she was pregnant with the Christ child. David, because she said she was king, she believed Christ dwelled within her. She had 22,000 followers in Russia. They were called the White Knights. She believed and told them and convinced them that they were the angels that did not fall in the battle in heaven. She stood before me. As I went to get the Wilton flowers, she grabbed the microphone out of my, her hand. This was the signal for the White Knights to attack, and they did. She said, he's the Antichrist, white knights attack. The white knights jumped up, probably 20 of them, and ran toward the stage. I was very glad that I had baptized many Russian army officers and KGB officers <laughs> who had become Christians, who had not forgotten their skills. <laughs> and so there was a tussle that night. We took those people to the police and we said, the police said, look, we can't control them. And so they said, we'll deputize your people. 
So they deputized our ushers, these former KGB officers and others, and every night when they tried to attack, for 12 straight nights they tried to attack. 12 straight nights. We tackled them. I didn't tackle them. I was preaching. But these others <laughs> tackled them, locked them in a dirty, stinky, smelly toilet under the Olympic Stadium, and they'd bang and then we'd let them go at the end of the meeting. Mary David Christ believed that there'd be a utopia on earth. And that's what she taught. But the Bible says, he's coming in clouds and every eye will see him. Deceptions, taking people captive because they do not understand the word of God. Any religious leader that changes the gospel and leads you away from Jesus Christ is false. Any religious leader that distorts biblical principles is false. Any religious leader that makes up their own rules and says the law of God is irrelevant in this generation. Beware, beware, beware. Here, a new cult leader has risen in America, in fact. Here, he is called the man Christ Jesus. That's what he says he is. It's obvious, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, there is only one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. There's only one word that's authoritative, and that's the Bible. How do you identify a cult? Thirdly, cults manipulate minds. They coerce members into submission. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve, and let it be the Lord. Anytime there's pressure, now look, if you yield to pressure, let me talk to students here tonight, young people watching. If you cave in to the social pressure at school and compromise your Christian values, anytime you cave in to external pressure, you are preparing to stand with the Antichrist at the end of time. Here's why. Because Jesus invites us to choose for him for now and eternity. But when we yield to pressure, because it is pressure, if you know what you ought to do and you don't do it because of social pressure, because of family pressure, because of job pressure, if you're yielding to that pressure today, you prepare to accept the Antichrist tomorrow. The Bible says, Revelation 17, verse 13, read it with me please. These are of what? One mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. There is something more important than unity. It's following Jesus and his truth. Amen. There are times that to follow truth means to step out and be different. There are times that to follow Jesus means you're gonna be different in your family. To follow Jesus means you're gonna be different in your school. To follow Jesus means you're gonna be different at your work. There are times, sir, that when you know the guys are going out drinking, that you're going to have to say, as a Christian, I just can't go. But you say, I'm yielding to that pressure. Yeah, you've got one mind. You're getting ready for the Antichrist. You see, if we cannot stand for Christ today, how will we stand when all the world is falling apart and the pressure to conform is enormous against us? The beast power will arise. Now, more people are interested in how do you identify the beast and what 666, 666 mean than they are the principles. I'll talk about who the beast is and what 666 means in a later lecture. But I want you to see the principles. To accept the cult at the end is to yield to social pressures of conformity and sacrifice the principles of Christ today. Look, Revelation 13, verse 16, he causes all, that is, he pressures all, both small and great. This is Satan, causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. This is the Antichrist power, Satan working through the Antichrist, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now they receive it two places, where? Right hand or foreheads. What does that mean, right hand? What does that mean, foreheads? That no one might buy or sell unless they have the mark or the name of the beast. What I want you to see is the principle Here's what the principle is. Nobody can buy or sell except they have this mark of the beast, the Bible says. Here is Revelation's conflict between good and evil. 
Revelation's conflict between Christ and Satan. What does it mean to receive the mark in your head? What does it receive mean to receive the mark in your forehead? Now tonight I'm not discussing whether it's literal or symbolic. That's another lecture. But I'm studying the principle behind it. What's the principle? Here's the principle. The hand is a symbol of force or coercion. So to receive the mark in the hand means that you are willing to sell Jesus Christ out for a human authority because of pressure. So if today you sell Christ out because of the pressure of your job, the pressure of your friends, the pressure of your husband, that is the principle that prepares you later to sell Jesus out to the Antichrist. So either by force or coercion, that's the mark in the hand that people will get. They'll be forced, coerced against their will. When Christ tells you to do something, don't sell Jesus Christ out cheap. Or the mark in the forehead, the forehead is a symbol of the mind. It means they're deceived in their mind. How do you keep from being deceived or manipulated in your mind? By filling your mind with the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart, Psalm 119, that I might not sin against thee. Filling our minds with God's word. So the devil will either try to force us or coerce us. So today, if I follow deceptions of God, of the evil one. When I know what God wants me to do, I'm preparing later days for that mark called the mark of the beast. But if I'm on my knees saying, Jesus. See, the weakest saint can stand, the weakest believer can stand against the Antichrist. The Antichrist is no match for the weakest believer that knows Christ. The Antichrist is no match for the person that's radically sold out for Christ. You don't have to worry that you'll be able to stand at the time of the end if you know Jesus. Because Jesus is living in your heart, living in your life. Now, the fourth thing about cults is this. Cults work miracles. Does God work miracles? Yes. Can Jesus heal the sick? Certainly can. But wait a minute now. Look at the cults. One, they have a human leader that substitutes his authority for Jesus. Two, the word of the leader, the tradition of the church, becomes more important than the word of God. Three, in this whole cult process, People are conditioned in their mind not to stand alone for Christ, but they're conditioned in their mind to go with the flow, to go with the masses. Fourthly, the devil will pull off a master deception by working miracles to apparently confirm the error that he has locked people in. Here's what it says in the book of Revelation. Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14. He the devil performs signs, that's miracles, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. The Bible goes on. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs or miracles he's granted to do in the sight of the beast. So how are people deceived? He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those what? Signs. If you want signs, wonders, and miracles more than you want Jesus, if you want signs, wonders, and miracles more than you want the truth of God's word, you will be ultimately deceived because the devil will give you what you want. Can God work miracles? Yes. Can the devil counterfeit those miracles to deceive people? Yes. That's what the Bible says. There are some churches very thin on preaching, very thin on preaching, but a lot of hallelujahs, a lot of so-called miracles, you know what's going to happen? Those people are going to be swept away by the mark of the beast because he's gonna give them what they want in spectacular signs, and if they're not grounded in Christ and grounded in the word of God, they will be deceived. The Bible says telling those that dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and did live. Jesus is calling us to give our lives to him. He's calling us to stand for him. He's calling us to anchor our minds in God's word. He's calling us to be willing to stand alone. He will work miracles, but the basis of our faith is never miracles. The basis of our faith is Jesus Christ and his word. Jim Jones, in People's Temple in San Francisco, would get up in the service and say, somebody over there in the fifth row, in the back, the man with the green shirt or the red shirt, I know you have heart disease. Get up, you're healed. He would say, I've listened to tapes, watched the video in those early days. He would say, somebody over here has cancer, get up and there were apparent miracles, so that when he deceived, they didn't see the deception because their eyes were fo focused on the spectacular miracles. Jesus leads us to him. Jesus leads us to his word. 
Jesus says to us, following truth and a committed heart is more important than a miracle. Jesus will work miracles, but he is the one who selects when the miracle is worked. I, God tells me what he's going to do. I don't tell him what he's going to do. Satan, in the last days, will try to deceive through the Antichrist. Satan, in the last days, will try to deceive. The Bible says, what's going to lead up to the battle of Armageddon? Here it is. Revelation 16, verse 14, they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. The spirits of demons perform signs that go out to the kings of the earth. They perform miracles to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The battle of Armageddon is going to come and men and women are going to be trapped in the deception of these miracles because they've turned their mind on the word of God. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. When God tells you what to do in his word, open your heart to receive his power so you can walk in the way of his word. Jesus gives us the fifth identification of a cult. Cults isolate converts from their families. Let me pause on this. The cults say, Oh, if you're a true follower of God, you'll separate from your family. Jesus Christ, when our hearts are converted, does not tell us to separate from our families. He tells us to go back and love our families for his sake. No husband has the right to tell his wife what to believe. No wife, because of what she believes, has the right to tell her husband he has to do that. In a Christian home, you may have a believer who is committed to Christ and an unbeliever. At times, there may be people coming to meetings like this. You may have a wife that comes on her own and a husband who doesn't come. And she says, what should I do? And what I say to a wife is this, or a husband may come on his own, or a child may come without their family. And I say, look, make Jesus Christ your sole guide. Follow his word. Demonstrate to your husband or your wife or your family, if you're a young person. Demonstrate what Christ does to a life. Don't badger them. Don't argue with them. But show what a loving Christian is in that home. But I tell them, Christ is calling you. Do not wait for a family member. Because when we stand before the judgment bar of God, we're gonna stand alone. You see, what the devil wants is mass conformity. The devil wants us to march in step. You know, I have people say to me, Pastor Mark, I'm coming to the meetings, but, but, but my grandfather was of this religion. My great-grandfather was of this religion. My great-great-grandfather was this religion. My great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. I've got such a heritage in this religion, I could never change now. And I think to myself, if that's your attitude, you're going to accept the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist says mass conformity. Don't make any changes when you know what Jesus wants you to do. See, that's what the Antichrist says. He says mass conformity. If the Jews would have had that attitude, the Jews did have that attitude. They said, look at our heritage. It always goes back to Jacob and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jews said, look, we got thousands of years of heritage in the past. That's why they crucified Jesus, because they wouldn't accept truth. You may be a lovely Christian. You're watching this telecast, wherever you are. Merely because you marched in step with the group before, even with your family, step out for Jesus Christ. You may be a wife here alone, a husband here alone. You may be a, ch a young person watching this. Christ calls you to step out for him. All of the cults in the past wanted conformity. Marshall Applewhite wanted all his people to dress the same, or be the same. No individuality. David Koresh all live in that same compound. You see, the cult principle is Jim Jones, the same thing. This sameness. Christ says, when I speak to you, I speak to you individually. If you know what truth is, step out and follow me. Jesus says, whoever you are, wherever you are, I'm appealing to you. You make that step. You make that decision. You follow me, Jesus says. Have that courage. The Bible says in Romans 14, verse 12, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. When we stand before the judgment bar of God, God's not going to say, what did your father do? What did your mother do? What did your sister do? What did your brother do? What did your aunt do? What did your uncle do? The Bible says every one of us must give account of whom? Himself to God. 
That is what God's word says. God is appealing to us to stand in courage. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you look to any human authority rather than Jesus Christ. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you accept the teachings of tradition rather than the word of God. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you're awed by spectacular miracles, when you know what God says in his word. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you fail to live by your own personal convictions, when you're molded and shaped by the traditions of the past, when you're molded and shaped by a religion that you've been brought up in, even if you see that God is leading you to do something else. You become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you fail to do what God puts in your heart to do. Come with me tonight. And look at what Jesus said, Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be added unto you. You want to win your family? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You're having pressure on your job. You may lose it if you step out for Christ and obey his commandments. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You don't know how to relate to friends at work. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Come with me. Come with me back, back to the first century. Come with me back to the ancient city of Smyrna. This is an amazing city. It was here that many Christians were persecuted. It was here that they would not burn incense to Artemis, the god of the Ephesians and the god of the inhabitants of Smyrna. It was here they wouldn't burn incense to gods like Dionysus, the god of wine. The Christians wouldn't burn incense to Sidon. They said, we are standing for Christ. It was here that once a year, in this very marketplace, in the shadow of these columns, that all of the inhabitants of Smyrna gathered. And as they gathered, they were to come by the statues of the gods of Rome and burn incense. There was one, a man by the name of Polycarp. I stood there on that very ground, this hallowed ground a few months ago. Smyrna means sweet-smelling incense offering up your life as a sacrifice to God. Polycarp, an early Christian in the second century was brought here. He was told to renounce his faith. He was told to burn incense to Caesar. The crowd began to shout. The crowd began to scream. In this very marketplace, the crowd shouted, this is the teacher of Asia. This is the destroyer of our gods. This is the father of the Christians. Away with him, away with him. The Roman proconsul tried to persuade him. The Roman provincial ruler, Stasius Quadrus, tried to make Polycarp deny his faith. Polycarp was an old man, 86 years old. And the emperor said, the Roman provincial ruler said, just burn the incense, old man. And Polycarp spoke up, and this is what he said. The stenographer wrote it down 2,000 years ago, and down through the cars of time, echoing and re-echoing in our ears tonight, calling us to faithfulness of the words of Polycarp. 86 years have I served him, Jesus Christ, and he has done me no ill. How then can I blaspheme my king? who saved me. He was burned at the stake that day, singing praises to God. This is no time for easygoing Christianity. Christ is calling us to be sold out for him. Jesus is saying to us, will you commit your life to me? The only safety in the face of the cult deception of the Antichrist is to be held in the hand of the true Christ. Will you say tonight, I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoe'er thy lot may lead. Listen, as Charles and Jennifer say, and wherever you are tonight, why not open your heart? Why not bow your head? Why not say, Lord, you're speaking to me. 
I won't conform to the social pressure. I will follow thee, my Savior. Is that the desire of your heart? Do you hear Jesus speaking to your heart? Do you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart? Do you sense that Jesus is calling you to make a decision that no matter what other people do, no matter what your friends do, no matter what your family does, you want to make a decision for Jesus? And you're saying, Jesus, I'm weak, but you're strong. Jesus, I don't have the strength, but you do. Jesus, I'm lifting my hand tonight to tell you that the best I know, I want my heart to be yours. If that's your decision, wherever you are tonight, would you raise your hand? You're saying, Jesus, I want to stand for you in these days of earth's history. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you tonight for Jesus, the living Christ. I thank you that the power of Christ is greater than the power of the Antichrist. I thank you that the truth of God's word is clearer than the deceptions of our world. I thank you tonight that the living Jesus will hold us in his hand, keep us safe till he comes. We commit our lives to you the best we know how. We open our hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Quietly, just be seated wherever you are. Wherever you are watching, quietly, no movement. And just in a moment of prayer till the end of the song, commit your life to Jesus Christ. See? 